order. I call this meeting of the Standing Committee on Human Resources to order. My name is uh, MLA Suzanne Lonis Croft. I'm the vice chair, but will be chairing the meeting for today. We will consider appointments to agency boards and commissions. I ask that members turn off their phones and put them on vibrate and any other people here in the uh, chamber as well. In case of emergency, please exit through the back door, walk down the hill to Hollis Street and gather in the courtyard of the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. We have some new procedures in place to protect everyone here today. And you'll notice that you're seated further apart. Please keep your masks on unless you are speaking. And we have provided bottled water instead of our usual um, coffees and whatnot, and no pitchers. So um, this is, I know, not the best for the environment, but for the virus it is. So um, we uh, want to use the bottles also to protect the new microphones. That's important. Um, we, we ask that you try not to leave your seat unless very necessary. Um, and if you do, you must mask. And we'll ask um, committee members to introduce themselves starting with the PC caucus. Ms. Adams. My name is Barbara Adams and I'm the MLA for Coal Harbor Eastern Passage. Brad John, Sackville Beaverbank. Kendra Coombs, Cape Breton Centre. Claudia Chender, MLA for Dartmouth South. Good morning. Miller, MLA for Hans East. Bill Horn, MLA for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West. And I'm Ben Jessam from Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. And we have our sh our clerks, Judy Kavanoff and Sherry Mitchell, um, our Hansard staff, and our Ledge Council, Mr. Gordon Hebb as well, here in the chamber. Um, we will now go and um, begin the committee business with um, agency board and commission appointments. Are there any appointments? Ms. D. Costanzo. For the Department of Agriculture, we have the Nova Scotia Farm Loan Board Andrew, sorry, I should practice that one. Yeah. Vermeulen? Vermeulen, Vice Chairman and Director. And then William Prestige as Director as well. So, should have taken Are there that. any comments? Mr. Johns? No? Oh, you have put your fingers up. <laughs> okay. Um, being no um, remarks, all those in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. Community, Department of Community Services. Mr. Horn. Department of Community Services, Nova Scotia College of Social Workers, Board of Examiners. Lisandra Noranjo Hernandez as a member. Leanne Chang as a member. And Roberta Boudreau as a member. Any comments? Being no comments, um, is all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion is carried. The Department of Health and Wellness, Ms. De Costanzo. Uh, for the Board of the College of Medical Imaging and Radiation Therapy Professionals, we have three names. Nicholas Burke as public representative, Anne Mann as public representative, and Hammond Mohi Endin as also as public rep representative. Thank you. Any comments? Being no comments, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion is carried. Uh, Service Nova Scotia and Internal Affairs. Mr. Jessam? Thank you, Madam Chair. At the Film Classification Board, uh, I move that Adiola Adbeo um, and Michael Baker 
be submitted. Oh, oh, we got a long list here. Uh, Michael Baker, uh, Sheila Clark, Joel Ferroy, Owen Hansen, uh, Janice Holmes, Darlene McDonald, Andrew McLeod, Sheila McDougall, and Leah Rinaldo uh, be accepted as members. Any comments? Being no comments, I'll ask for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. The Nova Scotia Real Estate Commission. Ms. DiCostanzo. For the Nova Scotia Real Estate Commission, we have Nancy McGrath as member. Any comments? Being no comments, all those in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. So this slate of people will go into the... Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Coombs. Thank you. At this time, we'd like to bring forward a motion, if that's acceptable to the chair. A motion. Uh, yes. The chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Frontline workers put themselves and their families in harm's way to take care of Nova Scotians during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, and they will do so again should we experience a second wave. The wage top-up was supposed to be a symbol of gratitude to frontline workers, but it excludes too many, it excludes too many workers and, it roll, and its rolled out has been mired in confusion and miscommunication. MLAs had recently been told by the Department of Health and Wellness that Northwood received funds to distribute to workers, only to learn a few days later this was not, in fact, the case. Now, almost five months after the province announced it would participate in the top-up program, employees at the epicenter of the outbreak in Nova Scotia are still waiting on the department to release the funds. In July, our caucus asked that this committee be provided with a list of employers and employees who qualify for the top-up, but this was voted down by my colleagues from the Liberal Party. These gaps and delays communicate to workers that their work is not important. Some have described it as a slap in the face. At the very least, they deserve to know when and if they will receive the wage top-up. I move that the committee write a letter to the Minister of Health and Wellness calling on him to immediately provide a list of employers and positions that have received the essential work top-up funds to date and provide timelines for all employers and positions that have not received the top-up that shows up which date they will receive the bonus. And I move. Any remarks? Um, Mr. Johns. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, the PC caucus would certainly support this, uh, the motion that's before us. I think it uh, provides clarity in, uh, in an area where there's a lot of misunderstanding and unclarity, so we certainly support this, and I know that uh, workers from various different uh, industries across the province would like clarity on this as well, so we'll support this. Thank you. Ms. Adams. Um, I'm very pleased to also support this motion. The, the circumstances with people working in long-term care and in, in health care in general is that they were all heroes for going into those buildings, especially in Northwood, given what was happening there each and every day. And as someone who actually was working in the nursing homes when this was coming down to the employees, there was an incredible amount of anger and frustration by the employees who found out that they were excluded from this benefit by the pure fact that they might not have had direct contact with residents in those nursing homes. And so I agree with writing a letter. I think that we have to be very considerate of the fact that whether you had direct patient care, you were still in those facilities working through a pandemic and each of those employees was deserving of benefits for showing up every day. And I'm grateful to the NDP caucus for bringing this forward and we'll be supporting it. Ms. Gender. Thank you. I just want to take a moment and speak in support of my colleague's motion. Um, I think, you know, as my colleagues on this side have pointed out, 
Um, <clears throat> this sort of hero pay or pandemic pay probably would not have been our first choice. Um, I think what happened at Northwood made really clear that in fact, uh, these folks need better pay all the time <laughs> and better benefits, and we need to create a better working situation. Um, but in the meantime, you know, what I hear from my constituents is that we've really, aside from calling people heroes publicly, done very, very little to support them. So we were the only province that didn't have childcare for essential workers. I know for a couple in my constituency, that was a major, major, major challenge. Um, they are both nurses. Um, and uh, so as we try to figure out now what we're going to do to make this situation better in the second wave, you know, this is the one thing that we have committed to um, as a province. And so I think that this request is really reasonable that people want to know uh, when they will get this. In many cases, they've been relying on getting this since it was announced. Um, and we all know that hearing you're going to get money and then getting it six months later is really challenging. So I think it's an eminently reasonable request just to ask for a list and a timeline. Okay. Mr. Horn. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Chair. I uh, have been investigating or uh, checking this out the last week. And uh, on Friday, I received a call from uh, health and wellness that indicates that it's imminent, it's imminent that uh, uh, this money will be going out to those that are supposed to be getting it. They have to do the paperwork of finding out uh, uh, how many shifts that they've been on and the times. But uh, I've been told that it's imminent and it will be coming sh shortly. Ms. Adams. Um. With all due respect to that, we still don't have a clear identification of all of those who were eligible for this and who weren't. And there is really no reason that it has taken this long, um, specifically because the dates that it was covering were April, May, June, and July, which is a long time ago. So there is no comfort to those who are calling our offices to hear that it may be coming. And so I'm not sure why there would be any hesitancy in, in writing a letter to ask for those specifics, because I think it would be nice to have it on record, the exact list of those who were eligible, because we certainly heard from people who were working in residential care facilities and group homes who also wondered why they were also not um, included in this. So I think a comprehensive list of everyone who was getting it and when they got it um, is it something that should be transparent um, so that we can indeed hold those who promise this money accountable? Ms. Coombs. I would like to thank my colleague. I couldn't agree more. In fact, you took the words out of my mouth. Um, I would also like to add is the fact that these workers have been told it's imminent or it's coming for a very long time. Also with the fact that there have been people who've been left out of this process. And that is, again, a very concerning fact. But we've been told lists were coming prior, uh, long, uh, months ago. We were told that the money was coming months ago. And so I think eminent, until they actually see the check and a date, eminent could be a very long time. Okay. Ready for the vote? Pardon? Recorded vote? And we'll ask the clerk to conduct the recorded vote. All right. Ms. Coombs? Aye. Ms. Chander? Yes. Mr. Johns? Yes. Ms. Adams? Yes. Ms. DiCostanzo? No. Mr. Jessam? No. Mr. Horn? No. Ms. Miller? No. Uh, Ms. Lonas Croft? No. So five no's and four yeses. So the motion has been defeated. Ms. Chender. Um, I'd like to raise a motion um, for the consideration of the committee. Uh, we have talked about schools before in this environment um, and the HR needs of schools, which I think is properly uh, considered and discussed at this committee. We understand that the reopening has required a tremendous amount of work from teachers, staff, and administrators, and parents, and families, and we really appreciate all those efforts. 
Um, and we also understand that given the uncertainty and unanswered questions about how schools would operate earlier this month, that an all hands on deck was needed in those first few weeks. And so what we were told um, by the Department of Education was that many non-teaching staff, so that includes youth health center workers, school specialists, so speech language pathologists, autism specialists were reassigned to help students acclimate to these first hectic few weeks, and I think also to help administrators, which makes sense. Um, but questions around when that reallocation will shift back to normal um, have gone unanswered. And so to that end, you know, we are very aware through our constituents um, and um, just as uh, keen observers, I guess, of the education system, that students need access to the services and supports that these staff members provide. We just did a massive inclusive education uh, process not a couple of years ago that made that very clear. Um, in addition, young people need access to sexual health information, learning supports, assessments, and now more than ever, those youth health centers in the middle of a pandemic really need to be open. And so our motion, um, I move that the committee write a letter to the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development calling on him to provide us with the number of non-teaching staff currently reallocated and the titles of their usual positions, an explanation of how these individuals are currently assigned, and the expected date that these staff members will return to their usual positions. Ms. Adams. Thank you, uh, and I appreciate the NDP caucus bringing this forward. One of the things that I'm hearing in my community is that some of the EPAs who had, you know, thought that they had permanent jobs in their schools were let go because the number of students that required that additional help was lower than expected, but it turns out that the, the number of students who needed to be assessed for those additional services had not been assessed yet. Um, one of the things that I haven't heard here, but this I am. Uh, this is my first time at this particular committee. Is I'm not aware of exactly how many students have chosen to remain at home. So the number of staff and the number of um, EPAs and others working in the schools. I don't know how they have been impacted in this province by the fact that there are a certain percentage of Nova Scotian parents who chose to keep their students uh, home from school. So I certainly support this motion, and as one of those allied health professionals, it is a complete disservice to those students not to be having those allied health professionals doing the job that they were required to do, um, and the fact that they also need protection to, you know, from their unions to be doing that job is certainly critical as well. And there's too many things up in the air that parents and teachers and allied health care professionals need in terms of job security and to make sure that the right people are doing the right thing at the right place at the right time. And there's no excuse now, um, given the number of COVID cases in this province, for those allied health professionals to not be doing what they were trained and hired to do. We have way too many students, especially those who need speech language skills and speech therapy and things that are gonna impede them from moving forward with their education. And so this motion should be um, approved by every member. I can't imagine why there wouldn't be approval to simply ask that question. I would like the NDP caucus to consider uh, an amendment to the motion to um, request um, a summary of what percentage of students in each region are being homeschooled, um, just so we have an understanding of how the departments have all reallocated resources um, because they certainly would have been impacted by those students um, being taught from home. Thank you. So now we have, that was an amendment. Yeah, Ms. Tender. Uh, thank my colleague, and I think that is an important issue. I would request that it come as a separate motion, just because I think it's slightly a slightly separate topic, and we would certainly support that motion, but I, I think it makes sense as a separate issue. Do you wish to... Yes, Ms. Adams. Thank you very much. So following the vote on this motion, I would like to make a motion that we write a letter to the Department of um, Education requesting an outline of you the... You can do that when you do your motion. Thank okay. you. I will. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. There is a motion on the floor by the NDP caucus. All those in favor? 
Opposed? Nay. Nay. The motion is defeated. Ms. Adams. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, given the fact that I know that there are staff in my community who got reassigned to other schools and were not expecting it, and given the fact that there are a number of students in my communities who are waiting for assessments for extra services, um, there, when I speak to the teachers and those in the schools, they tell me that it's all related to the fact that there are a number of students that are not in the schools. I'm also aware that there are a number of students that are out sick at any given time, which also affects staffing levels. So I'm in making a motion that this committee write a letter to the Department of Education asking them to outline the exact numbers of students attending each school in person and those who are being homeschooled and how the staffing structure has changed this year compared to previous years okay. as of 19. Any comments? Ms. D. Costanzo. Thank you, Madam Chairs. I'm just wondering if uh, my colleague has asked that question herself. Has she sent a letter to the, to the minister to ask and was not received an answer to her question? And also, uh, if, um, you know, the, these questions can be directed and she will get the answer from, from the minister. We, this is a committee for human resources and not for, a, for, for that specific uh, purpose. Thank you. Ms. Tender. Um, I, I'll forgive the members' ignorance being on the government side, but when we write letters with these questions, we in fact never get answers from the department. So it's not that the department isn't responsive. They certainly are responsive, and we work very well with the EAs and, and other folks in the public service. Um, but the reality is, is we don't get the answers to these questions. And many of these questions have been asked in lots of public fora, and the response um, that comes when pressed is often that we could FOIPOP that information. Um, and, and I would also take issue with the idea that this is, that's not the place of this committee. So in fact, this committee is the Human Resources Committee of the Nova Scotia Legislature, and we are talking about employees of the government of Nova Scotia and asking, I think, very reasonable questions about the allocation of those employees and what's happening. And so if we did get these answers, if we did have greater transparency, we wouldn't have to ask them here. So I can't answer whether my colleague's specific question was put forward in a letter or not, but I can tell you from my experience that when we bring a question forward here, it's because we aren't getting answers in other venues. And it's also not to shame or embarrass anyone. It's literally Early to get information. We're just, so the motions that you've seen today are asking questions about things that the government has announced. So the government announced a wage top up. We haven't seen it after months and months. So we're saying, what's happening with the wage top up? You know, we, we saw that staff got reallocated. That was not announced. People found that out. And we're hearing from specialists. We're hearing from parents who are saying, when is this going to end? And when that question is put to the department, which it has been in several different areas, there is no response. And so I think we are trying to use this committee, which, which is an opportunity for us to have a formal conversation constituted in our legislative capacities to get answers to those questions. And I think they're all very simple and reasonable questions. Um, so I continue to be a bit mystified. I mean, we're not making policy. We're asking to write a letter. Um, and I would think that the members of this committee, the Human Resources Committee, would all want this answer. Like, I don't understand why my liberal colleagues don't want the answers to these questions in public. I would love if somebody could tell me why they don't want the answers to these questions. Ms. Adams. Uh, thank you, and I appreciate the comments uh, by Ms. Chender because they echo. I do get letters eventually sometimes from some letters, um, but it is often weeks down the road when it doesn't make any difference to the people who are calling our offices. So we are their voices, and the issue that has just come up is there are staff who are losing their jobs and being reassigned based on the number of students in the school, based on the number of students needing additional resources, and yet those students are not getting tested for those resources. So the resource of teachers and uh, support staff in a school is the responsibility of this committee. 
and how many students are in those schools directly impacts that. So I'm simply asking for a number, which frankly, I would have thought the department would have released. You know, we release things like wait times for hip surgeries. I would have thought, given what we've just been through, that the department itself would have released those numbers in the beginning, after a couple of weeks when things settled out, this is how many students are being homeschooled, this is how many are in school, and these are the wait times for those students to get tested for additional resources. So again, I am always mystified why we don't want to be transparent about what is actually happening in our schools, but it directly affects constituents, and the answers are timely and important for those students needing resources, because once you've reallocated staff, if it turns out that another 20 students now need additional resources, now you've got to move those staff back again. And that's incredibly disruptive to the students as well as the teachers and the support staff who are being reallocated from one school to another. Thank you. Mr. Jessam and then Ms. Miller. <clears throat> I'd just like to state for the record that the allocation of uh, staff and the enrollment figures at our and our education system are date stamped every September 30th, and these numbers are made public on an annual basis. So I think we're kind of debating a, something that happens anyway at this point in time. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as a former minister in departments, uh, correspondence certainly was something that we always uh, took very seriously. Uh, I found that in the departments, it varied in departments because there is a, a correspondent staff certainly that look after that. And there's a huge volume of mail that actually does come in to the departments on a daily basis. Uh, usually it goes from anywhere from two weeks, and I've seen some correspondence that's been two months, depending on how uh, intricate the responses are, how much detail there is in the responses, but you know they do cross ministers' desks. They do, in the vast majority of times, if possible, that they're all responded to as quickly as possible. But it all depends on that, uh, on the volume of mail that go, the uh, mail that actually do does go into. Uh, into the departments. And beyond that, I would suggest that this may be uh, a good opportunity for agenda setting, to bring the subject up on agenda setting, and uh, that the, any of the opposition parties has the, that authority to do that. Ms. Adams. So I, I appreciate the volume of mail that everybody gets. We, we get mail as well. Uh, we certainly don't have the same resources that the ministers have, though. And it is their responsibility to respond to that. I know that the majority of letters that I write don't get responded to. So no matter how long it goes, and if we do get a response, and as the, the members just indicated, it can take months, that's too long for the people that are being impacted. This is our children we're talking about and their educational needs after just having been out of school since March. So while I appreciate that the numbers may be coming out in, in the end of September, um, that's no comfort to these people. It doesn't indicate to us what's going to happen in terms of the allocation of resources for students who need um, special assistance. So again, you know, I'd like to call for the motion, um, again, being puzzled why writing a letter, which the members say they are happy to respond to, would be something that the government doesn't support. Okay. We're ready to take uh, answer the question. All those in favor? Recorded vote. Ms. Kavanaugh. Ms. Coombs? Yes. Ms. Chender? Yes. Mr. Johns? Yes. Ms. Adams? Yes. Ms. DiCostanzo? No. Mr. Jessam? No. Mr. Horn? No. Ms. Miller? No. Ms. Lonas Croft? No. Five no's, four yeses. The motion is defeated. Mr. Johns? Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, at our last uh, meeting of the Human Resources Committee, I raised uh, some concerns in regards to lack of appointments and vacant seats on the Council of African Canadian Education. Um, after a very long recess uh, when the vote was called the uh, members from government have chosen at that time 
to turn that down. We still, uh, a month later, do not see in our packages any appointments, any correspondence. Uh, very disheartening, disappointing to me. I, uh, I question what uh, commitment of the government is to uh, the African Nova Scotian communities and to education when uh, this was raised last month and we still have nothing in the papers before us today in our package. Madam Chair, I'd like to move that the committee write a letter to the Minister of Education to ask exactly when we can expect the appointments to be made to this committee. Okay. So moved. Um, I think that was in a news article on Thursday um, locally, but um, uh, the response from the minister did speak to that. Uh, Mr. Justin. Yeah, I would just uh, reject the notion that um, there's some sort of appetite or purposeful uh, consideration to uh, disregard the needs of African Nova Scotians in this community or in our province. I represent two historic black communities and th th it's just fundamentally offensive to hear that. Um, I will say that uh, as per uh, the words of the minister, these appointments are actively being accepted. They're actively being pursued uh, for completion and appointment. And at this time, uh, I don't have a sense of uh, the number, nor is that something that we make public in, in, in any uh, appointment process. Uh, so the, 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 the intent is to fill those vacancies as soon as possible to a maximum of 17 members on that board with the assistance of the various organizations that are by by way of the, that uh, group, uh, that committee um, asked to appoint or submit recommendations to the minister for approval. So we'll not be supporting that motion. Okay. Mr. Johns. Yeah, you. Madam Chair, and uh, to hear uh, the member across from me say he's not going to support it doesn't surprise me because they didn't support it last time. Uh, what I will say is that it does certainly question, um, I think I have every right to question the commitment of the government when this was raised last month. Uh, here we are a month later, Madam Chair. There's still nothing uh, in our packages, no correspondence whatsoever. Um, you would think that uh, if the Minister, uh, either Minister of Education or Minister of African Nova Scotia Affairs uh, felt that this committee and that it was valid concern that was raised, it could have given us correspondence regardless of whether or not uh, the committee chose to do that. So uh, I certainly uh, do question and I think that uh, the public at large as well as the African Nova Scotia community are asking and have a right to know this uh, uh, when appointments will be made. So I don't see the harm in asking for a letter where the government uh, tells us when we can expect appointments to this board. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Chender. Uh, well, I'd like to push back on the notion. I mean, I, I understand you have your constituency and you have your relationship with your constituents, um, but the member, I should say. Um, but the reality is, is that there's been media coverage of this since Mr. Johns brought it, and we have heard from Carlotta Weymouth, who served on that committee. We have heard from Melinda Day, a former Liberal candidate, I should say, who have said that the reason that these positions are not being filled is because of a decayed relationship with the province. And so whether or not that's true, remains to be seen, all we have as members of this committee who approve these appointments are what's in front of us. And what we see is that the committee numbers have dwindled over the years and have not been replaced. And so again, we are asking questions and as we can see from today's proceedings, we never get answers. And so we are expected to sit in our seats as opposition members and rubber stamp all of the appointments and, you know, be good little MLAs and not ask questions. And so um, I understand that there may be lots of reasons that the government doesn't want to answer our questions or that the uh, members opposite um, don't like our motions or our questions. Uh, but you know, I, when we bring these issues up, we are bringing them up on behalf of our constituents. We are bringing them up on behalf of Nova Scotians who approach us. And so I think 
you know, to imply that this is somehow outrageous that we would suggest that um, is just inappropriate. We've, it's not us speaking. Mr. Johns raised the issue, but we've heard from several people on that committee, connected to that committee, who have said that, that this is an issue, and this is an issue around the government's, you know, attention uh, to this uh, particular constituency. Okay, we ready for the question? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Nay, the motion is defeated. We have some business here about our next meeting date. Um, the, on October 27th, the Natural Resources and Economic Development Committees will be meeting in the chamber um, that afternoon. So um, from one to three, and that's one hour after this committee meeting will end, if it's on time. So, um, the province house staff, today we were fortunate because we didn't have a, a, a witness in to, to speak to us today, um, but the, this whole chamber has to be deep cleaned between the meetings and um, the closeness of these meetings where we're not using the committee room, it makes it impossible for the deep cleaning. So we are, we are hoping that um, people will agree to move the natural resources to two o'clock, two to four on that date. Is that correct, Ms. Kavanaugh? Well, it's up to the committee. Yeah, and to allow for the deep cleaning on the 27th of October. Yes, Mr. Johns. So for clarification, did you say that the Natural Resources Committee would move to two to four? Or, yeah, well, or? we have to decide one need, One has to move. Either if we can um, agree, I chair both, uh, well, I chair the Natural Resources, so I'm fine with making that decision here with, with this group. So, uh, because in the morning you would have human resources and a witness, the cleaning time would have to be um, following the human resources meeting. Ms. Chender. I don't think this committee can determine whether a different committee can change the time because it's not the same membership. So I'm happy to consider whether we could move. I also sit on the Natural Resources Committee, so I think we could consider that this afternoon. But I don't think we can agree to that on behalf of our colleagues on a different committee. So we will just remain at this the regular time? We agree that we will meet the regular time. Yes, Ms. Miller. Thank you. Uh, could I suggest that we actually make that change and that, uh, excuse me, that uh, we move this committee to 9 a.m. and that would still give them the extra hour to prepare for afternoon without affecting the Natural Resources Committee. Okay, people in agreement with that? Okay, all right, so it is unanimous. Okay, um, that's fine. Um, um, the date of the meet, um, one of the approved um, witnesses um, for um, a meeting uh, is Ms. Uh, Kellyanne Dean that is coming up, who is the CAO of Nova Scotia Office of Immigration. And it's difficult for Deputy Dean to attend a meeting on a Tuesday morning because she meets with her forestry transition team. Um, so does the committee agree to hold the November meeting on a Thursday morning? That would be Thursday, November the 26th. Are we in agreement for that so that we can have uh, Mr. Johns? Just a moment. If you I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I'm just quickly looking. So that would be the 26th of November? Yes. I can't speak for everybody else, but I don't have an issue with that. Um, Ms. Chender. That's fine with me, uh, but I just want to clarify that if the House is sitting, which there is a good chance it will be at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, are we still going to proceed with committees in this chamber? I would hope the answer is yes. Um, Ms. Kavanaugh. Well, I don't have inside information on that. I don't know. Uh, under normal circumstances, this committee meets regardless of whether the House is sitting. Uh, and 
if the House is sitting, though, we don't have witnesses, you simply meet to consider appointments to ABCs. So it would be a short meeting without witnesses. Ms. Gender? So I'd love to just confirm, because when, when we bring these questions to the speaker, what he says is committees are their own creatures. They decide. So as chair, I guess I'm asking you, Will this, can we confirm that this committee will meet, given that there will be at least an hour for deep cleaning of the chamber, just as there would be between this well, and another committee meeting? I would say is that I would affirm what the clerk just said. If the legislature is sitting, we would not have our witnesses in that day. We would just have commissions and, and appointments to deal with. That's normally the procedure during House sittings. So that this, this meeting, uh, our witness would be bumped to another meeting. Um, Mr. Jessam, did you have your hand up? No? Okay, Mr. Johns. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, I certainly appreciate uh, the opportunity to be back in the legislature and be in, in the room to have our meeting. Um, if by some chance uh, this room or another room wasn't available, I would hope that we would default to what we were previously doing, which would be to continue to conduct the meeting even if uh, virtually. But I, I think we've been able to do that now for the last four months, so hopefully uh, that would be an opportunity if not in here. Thank you. I'm not the chair, but I would think that that, that would definitely be our, our other resource. Ms. Uh, Coombs. Yes, thank you, um, Madam Chair. My question is, should it, and hopefully we are, my goodness, meeting um, uh, in the legislature, but would that Thursday then become Tuesday again if we're not having, if we're not making the exception? <laughs> it's just a question of clarity. Um, we'll let the clerk uh, work out those details, okay, if, should that be the, the issue. And, and she's very efficient, I can tell you, and she keeps me well informed. <laughs> so I, I think we can depend on, she, she will make adjustments as they need according to the usage of, of the legislature. Okay. Um, well, I think that um, this will adjourn our meeting and um, we will see you all next month. Some of you I will see in just a couple of hours for natural resources. This meeting is adjourned. And yes, they get their per diem, right? <laughs> What, how much time is it you have to sit for for deal? 15 minutes?